from the Voice of Victory podcast. I'm so glad you tuned in tonight. I look forward to being able to uh, come into your home, in your car, wherever you're at, and share with you from the Word of God. We have people from all over the world that uh, look at the podcast at different times. It goes from here off of Facebook and many times, most of the time we put it into YouTube and then all around the world it's available to see it. And so um, it's something that we are hoping that we are helping people to grow closer to Christ, to get much closer to Christ. And so I uh, hope that you'll pray with me that we can do that. That's what it's all about and is getting the Word of God out. And we try to deal with different subjects. We try, try not to stay in the same place all the time. We try to move around, do books and do uh, statements and things like that, uh, positions of people in the Bible. We try to balance it out. Uh, as you've probably seen every day now, I've been doing a devotional and sending that devotion out. And that really comes from the books that I've written. Uh, I wrote uh, four books on the Proverbs. And so what we're doing is we're reproducing that out every day, one of those Proverbs to uh, to the people. And it goes out and we've had some uh, great responses off of that. We praise God for that. And uh, that's what it's uh, that's what this ministry is all about is it's a helps ministry to help other people we have uh, churches around the world we have people that I have ministered to over the years overseas in the Philippines uh, in Guatemala we have them in Ukraine we have them all over the world that watch this podcast not at the same time you're watching it or right now live but at some point they're watching it they turn it on and look back at it we praise God that it's getting out to people like that and uh, we don't know how many we, we really don't try to keep up with that but we do know that we are reaching uh, several people and then we added here about um, about three months ago we added uh, and most people don't like this we added TikTok. we put something together into that on a uh, basis of uh, biblical principles on the worst on what we're doing as a nation or our nation's heading and the problems that we have and I've been that's on another side that's on another venue and uh, that is uh, more of a secular but it it does deal with the everyday problems that we have and uh, we're hoping that we're able to uh, help individuals I'm going to be doing something uh, on TikTok here and uh, sometime this evening on uh, the matter of reparation reparation and I want you to pray about that because it's become a big thing that some people think that they need to be paid uh, for what their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents went through what a stupid thing to say is they want to be paid for that they haven't earned anything not a thing maybe their grandparents did but they haven't they haven't earned a thing so I mean it's wrong when you have people trying to do that trying to find another way to get rich or to have be able to do more, or be uh, ahead of the game, as one might say. They don't want to work for it. They want to get it for nothing. And that's the problem in America today, is we have too many people that don't want to work for a living. They want it free. They depend upon the government to give them everything. Now, I agree. There are benefits in the government. There are uh, Social Security. There are pensions and different things that are, are important for us, to, uh, for individuals, people that are older and people that have worked all their life and people that maybe aren't capable of working. But I mean the whole thing, that's part of the uh, our government system in caring for the people. Please excuse my dogs in the background. Every now and then they just, they're, something happens outside and they start barking. <laughs> but that's okay. So, but tonight we're going to, um, we're going to start a new project tonight. We're going to go into uh, the Holy Spirit. I think it's important for us to understand the third person in the Trinity. There is the Father, there is the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit. There is much to be said about the Holy Spirit, and there's a lot of confusion out there about the Holy Spirit. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to deal with some of those things to help you from a biblical prospect and making sure that uh, we make it, try to make it as clear as possible. And tonight we're going to start on the personality of the Holy Spirit.
because it's important for us to understand that. We'll be dealing, as time goes along, we'll be dealing not only with the personality of the Holy Spirit, but we'll also be dealing with uh, the deity of the Holy Spirit and then the representation of the Holy Spirit and uh, the Holy Spirit, his part in creation, the Holy Spirit's part in revelation and inspiration. We'll be dealing with all of these subjects. So, and they'll be at each one of the, t each time that I do this, I, whether it be Sunday night or Sunday or uh, uh, a Wednesday night, but we'll be doing it. So pray for us as we try to make this available. We're hoping to put this into a full series that uh, people uh, around the world can use in their home for Bible studies. So uh, pray for some individuals. I've got some people to pray for uh, tonight. Darlene's husband, I will ask you to pray for him. Also pray for Lenny Glazer. He's got some problems and he needs some, some prayer. And then uh, my son-in-law, Barry Tosh, needs prayer. He's got problems with his back, real problems with his back. And I uh, appreciate you praying for him. And my son had some surgery the other day, and uh, he's just getting through that. I appreciate his name, Sean. I appreciate you praying for him. Uh, we are just, you know, trying to pray for one another. And, of course, I'm going in for another oblation next Monday. Monday. One day. <laughs> you know, one of the things, I don't know if you notice this or not, but if you lose teeth, you lose how to talk. <laughs> And over the last year, I've had about five or six teeth pulled. And hopefully I'll get some new ones here. But, I mean, it does make a difference in how you talk. And uh, I find myself saying, not saying words as clearly as I should. So please excuse me. It's because I don't have any teeth. <laughs> but I do have teeth, but I don't have as many as I need. So uh, praise God for that. So I, at, least I, at least I can chew what I eat. Amen. I, I can do that. And that's important. So let's begin with prayer tonight. Father, thank you for each one that's joined in tonight. And I pray that, Lord, as we get into our study tonight, that it will be a blessing to each one that listens and that they'll open their eyes to you and grow in faith and grow in love for you. God, we just know that without you, we can do nothing. We are, we're, we're lost without you. And Lord, we need your, we need your guidance. We need your wisdom. We need, uh, Lord, for you to instruct us in every way and to help us to stay in the path that's right to honor you. Lord, we, the devil is like a roaring lion. He battles every day with people, with me and everybody else. He wants to get us to go contrary. Our world is really in trouble, God. People today are, are they're not glory, going, growing closer to you, but God, they're, uh, they're, it seems like they're growing Father, apart from you. And so, God, I pray that you will help individuals to grow closer to you. Help me to grow closer to you. Each one of us, Lord God, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The truth of the personality. First of all, let me say this to you. He, the Holy Spirit, is not an it. He's not an it. The Holy Spirit is of a very fundamental importance. To deny it is to deny his real existence. The existence of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the teaching of the scriptures on this subject. Nevertheless, we need to look at his personality. Because it has been denied throughout the ages. First, by the Monarchians and the Ararians. Arius called him the exorcist energy of God and the Senecians in the days of the Reformation. In more recent times, his personality has been denied by many individuals, the Unitarians, the liberals, and almost all neo-Orthodox theologians have denied the Holy Spirit. Often those who deny his distinct personality substitute the word personification for personality. But that term does not have the same meaning in their teaching as personality does in the orthodox doctrine. The reasons for the truth of the personality. That's number one tonight. The reasons for the truth of personality. The Holy Spirit has attributes of personality. The Holy Spirit has attributes. If personally, if personality may be simply described as possessing intellect, 
emotion or sensibility and will then it is easily demonstrated that the Holy Spirit has a personality because he has intelligence he also has emotions and he also has will let's look at number one on this part of this attribute of personality let's look at his intellect the Holy Spirit knows and searches the things of God 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11 said but God hath revealed them unto us by the Spirit for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So we see here that the Holy Spirit knows and searches. And then we need to look at Isaiah chapter eleven twelve and compare that. Isaiah eleven two rather, I'm sorry. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Let's look at those things just for a moment, please. The spirit and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, that's us. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit plays a big part in our relationship with God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Also, he said to possess a mind. He says that we are to possess a mind. Romans chapter 8 verse 27. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit has a mind. He's able to teach people, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 13, which things also we speak, not in words, not in words, but, not in, I'm sorry, I lost my place here, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So we see that he is able to teach us. He's able to guide us. And then all these activities stem from this involving intelligence that the Holy Spirit has. He's intelligent. And then number two, he's, he, he has emotions and, he's, uh, and sensibility. He has emotions or sensibility. The fact that the Spirit show that the Holy Spirit has feelings is a further proof of his personality. For instance, it is said that the Spirit can be grieved by sinful actions of believers. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's the warning by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. A fact that would uh, be meaningless if he were not a person. For an influence, and he cannot be grieved, but he can. In another place, Paul bases an, an exhortation on the believers in Rome to pray with him and for him and to and the love of the Spirit, Romans chapter fifteen thirty. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that he strive together with me in your prayers of God for me. Here Paul is praying for the spirit of love in individuals. And then I want you to notice not only his intellect, not only his emotions, or sensibility, but I want you to notice also his will. The important ministry of the of distributing spiritual gifts to individuals, believers, is said to be in accordance to the will of the Spirit. First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse eleven. But all these worketh the one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he wills. God gives to us the gifts that we need to do through the Holy Spirit. You see, it is we are his will is seen in his ability to direct the activities of God's servants. 
He directs our way if we listen. This is the will illustrated by the Spirit leading Paul at, at uh, Mycia and Troas. He forbade Paul to preach in Asia, in Bithynia, and then he led him in his party to Europe through the visions of the man of Macedonia, Acts chapter number 16, verses 6 to 12. Now when they had gone through Persia in the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, in Asia after they were come to Mysiah, they essayed, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they passed by Mysia and came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man from Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over unto Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen this vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, surely gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, losing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samaritia, and next day to Nepalius, and from thence to Philippi. My friends, you see, the Holy Spirit was guiding. He sent someone to guide Paul. In addition to these particulars, the entire doctrine of the deity of the Spirit is further proof of his personality. It's further proof of what he stands for. The Holy Spirit, and we'll get into some of this a little later as we continue. The Holy Spirit perform, performs the actions of personality. Number two, the Holy Spirit performs the actions of personality. Actions are attributed to the Holy Spirit that cannot be attributed to a mere thing or influence or personification or power or imagination. Such actions then must be those of a person, thus proving the personality of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Spirit teaches, but the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I said to you, John 14:26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So we see that the Spirit is a teacher. And then number two, we see that the Spirit testifies or witnesses. When the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me, John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you, the Father, even the Spirit of truth, truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God, Romans chapter 8, verse number 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. People who are filled with the Spirit have the Spirit. You can sense that if you have the Spirit. And then not only does the Spirit teach, not only does the Spirit testify, but the Spirit also guides. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And not only does he guide, but the Spirit convicts or convinces individuals. He convicts or convinces individual. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he cometh, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. 
And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. We have to understand this is really, really important too. What God came in the Old Testament and he spoke to man. And then we see that Jesus came in the New Testament. And he dealt with man and died for man. And then Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send you the Holy Spirit. There is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in action. Right now, the Holy Spirit has been guiding us ever since Jesus came and ascended up to heaven. And when he's finished, then of course Jesus will come back. Now the Spirit restrains. Then the Lord said, My Spirit shall not strive with men forever because he is also is flesh nevertheless his days shall be 120 years that's that's interesting when you think about that john 16 verses 7 uh, i mean i'm sorry genesis chapter 6 uh verse number 3 and the lord said my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he is also is flesh yet his days shall be 120 years then there's the next one, which after the Spirit restrains, the Spirit commands and directs people. The Spirit commands and directs people. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto him, go near and join thyself to this, to this chariot. The Spirit commands and directs. The Holy Spirit is a silent but still voice that speaks to individuals, telling them what they need to do. If you listen, if you really listen to the Holy Spirit, you will hear him speaking to you. Now, it's not an audible thing. It's not something he comes up and yells in your face. It is in a subconscious way he speaks to you. And then we see that the Spirit performs miracles. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but went his way rejoicing. This is talking about Philip when he went down as an evangelist and spoke to the man that was in, it was, he was on his way, and he was reading the Bible, and Philip went and showed him what the Bible said. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Then the Spirit calls for a special service. There's the Spirit calls individuals or for a special service. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Acts 13.2 you see, Paul and Barnabas were called by the Holy Spirit, set apart as missionaries to go uh, into the uttermost parts of the world. Then we see not only that the Spirit calls people for a special service, but we see that the Spirit sends forth, uh, sends forth into Christian service. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there sailed to Cyprus, Acts chapter 13, 4. Once again, he gives direction. And then we notice also that the Spirit intercedes. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for the words. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not... <coughs> we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings <coughs> which cannot be uttered he intercedes for us he prays for us granted some of these actions can be formed by intimate or impersonal objects for example a book can teach a plaque can testify a map can guide but behind such impersonal objects are the persons who were involved in creating the impersonal and inanimate object 
These examples are therefore legitimate evidence for the personality <coughs> of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit performs the actions of personality. He does that through the Spirit teaches, the Spirit testifies, the Spirit guides, the Spirit convicts or convinces, the Spirit restrains, the Spirit commands and directs people. The Spirit restrains, the Spirit commands and directs people. The Spirit performs miracles, and the Spirit sends forth into, sends forth Christians to service, and the Spirit intercedes, and we see that the Spirit intercedes, and the Spirit is led by God. My friends, the Holy Spirit, number three, receives the ascription of personality. We see now that the Holy Spirit receives the ascription of personality. Looking at this, we've seen thus far that the Holy Spirit has attributes of personality. We see the Spirit performs the actions of personality. And now we see that the Holy Spirit receives the ascription of personality. Certain acts are performed toward the Holy Spirit that would be most incongruous if he did not possess true personality. The Spirit can be obeyed, number one. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you, but get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men, Acts chapter 10, verses 19, verses 21a. We understand this is when Cornelius came into the fact, and this is the teaching that Peter was going to get from God. The Spirit, the Spirit can be obeyed. And then we see the Spirit can be lied to. The Spirit can be lied to. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? Acts chapter 5, verse number 3. We know this had to do with Ananias and Sapphira and selling property and that they lied to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be lied to. And then the Spirit can be resisted. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. I believe today that there are many, many people who are saved, believers, but they do not listen to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit can be resisted. In other words, I'm not going to do what I know I should do. I'm going to do what I want to do. So we see that in the times that we live today, this is a constant thing happening. But then the Spirit can be grieved. The Bible says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Ephesians chapter four <clears throat> verse number chapter four, verse number thirty. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieving the Holy Spirit is is not good because, you see, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you grieve the Holy Spirit, you're grieving Christ and you're grieving God. So you, you have to listen. He has been sent here to be with us during this time period until Jesus comes again. The Holy Spirit is Christ, is God. All three are one. Then the Spirit can be reverenced. The Spirit can be reverenced. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 5111. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The Spirit can be blasphemed. Therefore I say unto you, any sin and blasphemy shall, shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit 
shall not be given. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. They call that the sin unto death, where the person, if the person blasphemes the Holy Spirit. I believe what that basically boils down is refusal. When the man refuses God, refuses the Holy Spirit, I believe that God will not tolerate that. That's at the point whereby the person has no chance to get into heaven because they've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. The Spirit can be outraged. Not only can he be blasphemed, but he can be outraged. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has regarded us unclean, the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. I believe that the, the Spirit can be outraged. I believe we can really upset the Holy Spirit, and he can get very upset. As stated, to act in these various ways toward an influence would be unheard of. These acts, therefore, ascribe personality to one toward whom they are performed, the Holy Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit is not an it, he's part of the Trinity, then he is to be dealt with just like you deal with God and like you deal with Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit contradicts the accidents of personality. The accidents of personality. The accidents refers to the rudiments of grammar. The Greek word for spirit is menuma, from which we derive English words that have to do with air, such as pneumatic, pneumosia, and neuter gender words. According to every normal rule of grammar and any pronoun, that would be substituted for the neuter noun would itself have to be neuter. However, in several places, the Bible or the biblical writers did not follow that normal rule of grammar. And instead of using a neuter pronoun when referring to the neuter noun uh, pneuma or pneumatic, they deliberately contradicted the grammatical rule and used the masculine pronoun. Indeed, these, indeed, they use two different kinds of pronouns, all in the masculine gender. This shows us that we are to consider the Spirit to be a person and not merely a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. That's what he is, three persons in one. John 16, verses 13 and 14 say this, How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. We see in John that here is a masculine demonstration of pronouns occurring, referring to the Spirit. Some explain the gender of the pronoun as referring back to the masculine word helper. However, this is less likely, since spirit is the nearer antecedent. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14, which is the earnestness of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. In this passage, the masculine relative pronoun is used for the neuter noun, pneumatic or pneuma, spirit, pneumatic spirit. Relative pronouns are translated who if masculine or feminine and which it if neutered. The masculine pronoun in the Greek is the first word in the verse, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to praise of his glory. It refers back to the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believe, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The, these departures from the normal rules of grammar in connection with the use of several kinds of pronouns are evidence that for John and Paul, the Holy Spirit was more than mere influence. He was a person. He was a person. Now let's look at the ramifications of the truth of personality. The ramifications of the truth of uh, his personality. Those who argue against the personality of the Holy Spirit often err in their basic definition of personality. They define it by what is known as of human personality. But all human personality is imperfect. God alone has a perfect personality. So any definition of truth or true personality must start from the study of God's character. Usually those who deny the personality of the Holy Spirit do not deny the personality of God the Father and sometimes do not deny that of the Son either. Therefore, if the Holy Spirit is shown to be God, then he has also been demonstrated as the Holy Spirit has a personality according to the God-oriented definition of personality. It is a false assumption, my friends, to suppose that the perfect personality exists in any human being. We don't have, we're not perfect. Of course, it goes without saying that the true personality needs not necessarily involve, involve corporal or possessing the physical body. For example, when people die, they do not cease to be a person even though they no longer possess the physical body. In relationship to other persons, let's look at that for a moment. If the Holy Spirit has personality, then one would expect to find him related to other persons as a separate and an indefiable personality. Such is the case in the following examples that I'm going to share. The apostles. He related to the apostles as if he has a personality, though divine, just as they did, though human. At the same time, he distinguished them from a separate person. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. Acts chapter 15, verse 28. It would seem quite unnatural thus to associate him with the apostles if he were just mere influence or force. The Lord Jesus Christ, we look at the apostles, now we look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He is related to Christ in such a way that if the Lord has personality, it must be concluded that the Spirit does too. At the same time, the Spirit is distinguished from Christ so that we know that we are not the same person. He will glorify me, he says. He will take of mine and will disclose it to you. What he does will take the Holy Spirit, take from God and give it to you. John 16, 4. He shall glorify me, for he received, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Then there's the other persons of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is also related to both of the other persons of the Trinity in such a way to indicate personality. In the passage where this occurs, it would be completely unnatural to regard the Spirit as a thing while understanding the Father and the Son as a person. The baptismal formula is the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. Not only does the this associate, association of the Spirit with the Father and the Son argue for the Spirit's personality, 
but the use of the word name in a singular also indicate that he is a person, just as others are. The apostolic benediction leads to the same conclusion. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. First, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you. Amen. Then we see not only his, uh, his, the, the other persons of the Trinity, but now we also see his own power. Further, the Holy Spirit is related to his own power and yet distinguished from it so that one may conclude that the Spirit is only power. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Luke chapter 4, verse number 14. A verse like this leads one to understand that the Spirit is a person who has power and not the Spirit is simply powerful force or thing. Other examples of this distinction between the Spirit as a person and that person's power are found in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Look with me there. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's in the virgin birth. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now we look at, in this relation to deity, we need to look in this relationship to do it. That's saying that just as Jesus Christ was deity, he was born of God, he was God, the personality of the Holy Spirit argues for the deity of the Holy Spirit for two reasons. First of all, the definition of personality. A proper definition of personality supports the fact of the deity of the Spirit. Then we see conjunction with other persons of the Trinity. The passage that proves personality name or, or other persons of the Trinity and such a close connection that they can be explained properly and fully only understanding that the Holy Spirit is a divine person just as the Father and the Son are. The passages are the baptismal formula from Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, and the apostolic benediction found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Now we see in relationship to deity. Now let's look in relationship to us. Since he is a person, then my dealings with him are on a person-to-person -person basis. Your dealings with him are on a person-to-person -person basis. By contrast, one writer has tried to describe or define the Spirit as the mysterious power of God, as the mode of God's activity, a force as the mode of God's operation in the church. But the Spirit is not merely a mysterious power or a mode of operation or a force. He is a person. If he is mysterious, then probably I cannot know and understand him. If he is a mode of operation, then he may be on the same lower level as other modes of God using in the world. If he is a force, then he is impersonal. However powerful, and perhaps in some instances at least I could be a greater force and control him, but since he is a person, and since he is God, and since he has been revealed to us in the Bible, then my dealings with the Spirit, or with a divine person whose activities, expectations for me are very clear. David asked, where can I go from your spirit? His answer was nowhere. Psalm chapter 139, verses 7 to 12. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? 
whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. But the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. You see, my friends, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I am sending the Comforter. The Holy Spirit is the Comforter. He, he has come to keep us, let's say, intact. Keep us on the right track. And if we listen to him, he guides us. He directs us. And he, he helps us, folks, to, to do what we're supposed to do. As we've been looking at the Holy Spirit tonight, we've looked at several things. Let's do a little quick review and we'll come back over it, okay? All right. First of all, the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's not an it. The Holy Spirit has uh, attributes. The reason for his truth, the truth of his personality, is because of these attributes. He has an intellect. He has emotions or stability, has sensibility. He has a will. We also know that in that he has a will, the Holy Spirit performs the actions of his personality. What are the actions? The Spirit teaches. The Spirit testifies or witnesses. The Spirit guides. The Spirit convicts, convicts or convinces. And then we see that the Spirit restrains. The Spirit commands and directs people. And then the Spirit performs miracles. And then we see the Spirit calls for special service. And we see that the Spirit sends forth into Christian service. And then we see the Spirit intercedes. All of these things we see through the Holy Spirit. And then we see that the Holy Spirit receives the ascription of personality. In that the Spirit can be obeyed. The Spirit can be lied to. The Spirit can be resisted. The Spirit can be grieved. The Spirit can be reverenced. The Spirit can be blasphemed. The Spirit can be outraged. All these things the Spirit can do. And then we see that the Holy Spirit counterdicts the accidents of personality. We see here we see his accidents in that he he can do what he says he's going to do. It's, we understood we'd use the verbs and use the pronouns and, des and describe this accidents of the personality. We saw the masculine side. Then we saw the ramifications of the truth of the personality. That's in relationship to the idea of his personality. We saw that those who argue against the personality of the Holy Spirit often err and their basic definition of personality. They define it by what is known of human personality. But all human personality is imperfect. God alone has a perfect personality. And so by definition, a true personality must start with a study of God's characteristics. We see not only that, his relationship with other persons. And that, that a relationship he had with the apostles relationship he had with the Lord Jesus Christ and then the other persons of the Trinity and then we see his own power and then we see in relationship this personality to deity we see that the definition of personality we see the conjunction with the other persons of the Trinity and then we see in relationship to us his relationship to us he is our leader he is our guide. He is our director. He's the one who gives us the power to do what we need to do when we lean on him. He is not a force. He is a person. He's a person of God in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So tonight we've done our first lesson on the Holy Spirit. I hope I've helped you to understand a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Come This coming Sunday night, good Lord willing, I'm going to deal with God or ghost, the deity of the Holy Spirit. 
God or ghost, the deity of the Holy Spirit. Please come back with me and join with me 8 o'clock on Sunday night as we continue in our study on the Holy Spirit of God. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Remember, the Holy Spirit loves you. He prays for you. He's there for you. He's the one that guides you. He's that little small voice that's speaking to you and trying to keep you on the right course. Remember, he prays for you. And he makes intercession for you. Thank you for joining me tonight. God bless you. Keep a smile on your face, a song in your heart, and please go and tell someone about Jesus today, for he loves you. God bless you, my friends. Remember that God loves you.